Hey there, it's Jamie Anderson, and I am really excited about the release of my third book, Drive All Day, because I'm too old to drive all night. Here's what it looks like. Now, this is just something I printed off my computer. The paper book will be more like a book, more like this size. And this is my first memoir, Drive All Night. Get it? Drive All Night, Drive All Day. The ebook is available right now, and I'll put links to that underneath it. It's available at the usual suspects, including Golden Run Music, Amazon, and I don't even know where, just lots of places. So be sure to look for it. And like my first book, it's a collection of true life stories from a musician who has toured and taught for over 30 years. I've got uh, stories about my travels, like my trip to Dollywood with my mother where I learned that if you ride the roller coasters, you should bring a jumbo bottle of ibuprofen with you. I talk about my trip to New York City where I came this close to appearing on the TV show Kelly and Ryan. I have stories about my students, including of the excuses that I get, some that are very creative, like um, she didn't practice because we couldn't find her guitar. Turns out her guitar was in the back of their van for a week. It was so covered with stuff they couldn't find it. I have um, a chapter about Alex Dobkin, one about Alison Bechdel. I tell you about the festivals that I've gone to. And I'm going to read one of the chapters for you. This is about something that happened to me in Ottawa, Canada, where I live. When I first got the day hospice gig, I envisioned beds filled with weak-looking people surrounded by solemn loved ones, my soothing music helping them rest. Turned out they'd rather hear eight days a week or wagon wheel. I played in a comfortable living room, not a bed in sight. Usually there was a raucous card game going on as a volunteer pushed a cart with snacks and juice served in elegant wine glasses. I always looked for Andrew when I arrived for my shift. When I first met him a year ago, a middle-aged white guy in casual clothes, brown hair carefully combed to the side, he was thin and moving slowly. Even though he kidded me about the ukulele, he sometimes looked my way and smiled when I did a song he liked. Turned out he just liked to hassle me since he played a superior instrument, the guitar. After being away for the summer, I came into the living room. I moved a chair unfolded the music stand and pulled the ukulele out of the case. While I tuned, I looked around for Andrew. When I didn't see him, my first thought was, did he pass? I always wondered when I saw someone one week and not the next. It could simply be that they recovered or went to another hospice. However, it could be the inevitable. Fifteen minutes passed before Andrew strolled into the room with an energetic step. He looked better than that first time, his color robust, so my thoughts switched to something more positive. Maybe he was recovering. I didn't know anything about Andrew's health. We weren't allowed to ask why the clients were there unless they brought it up. We were only provided, we only provided art projects, card games, food, massage, and music. I was usually background music for a decibel busting card game. Someone played a good hand, and they all screamed with laughter, then pointed fingers at Andrew, accusing him of having cards up his sleeve. I didn't care that they found Euchre more interesting than my music. They were there to enjoy themselves, and perhaps forget about pain and hospitals and what their last test revealed. Once in a while, I saw a foot tapping or lips moving to the lyrics. Sometimes they clapped after I finished a song. Usually they didn't. They didn't know I'd toured for over 30 years or that I recorded 13 albums. It didn't matter. Andrew told me he liked Credence Clearwater Revival, so one week I brought in songs for him. Partway through Bad Moon Rising, I realized it was one of those songs where you didn't really hear the lyrics until you sing them. There I was cheerfully singing about rage and ruin at the end of the world when I decided that one verse and a chorus was enough. I switched to Down on the Corner. An upbeat song about buskers was much better. One week I brought the guitar. Andrew grinned and commented, You brought the big boy. Big girl, I corrected, and we laughed. I'm good at faces, bad at names. I remember Andrew because he was there every time. He doesn't always recall my name, and sometimes he looks confused when I bring up his guitar playing, like he can't fathom how I know that he plays. 
Some weeks we've had conversations about kinds of music and guitars, but his meds probably scramble his brain. As long as he enjoys our talks in the moment, it's good. One day Andrew was in the parking lot smoking a cigarette when I walked up for my gig. Oh good, it's you, he said between puffs. When it's not you, that lady with the harp shows up, and I'm not ready for that yet. One day an elderly gentleman slowly lowered himself into a recliner near me. A volunteer covered his lap with a blanket. He confided that he couldn't sing or remember the words to anything. I assured him that it didn't matter. When we got to the chorus of Brown Eyed Girl, I invited him to sing along. He softly sang in a creaky voice. Sha la 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 ti da. See, you can remember the words, I complimented him. A smile lit, lit up his face. A young woman in her 30s was off in there. She wore a turban and sat next to an oxygen tank. As I was packing up one day, she smiled and commented that she liked those old songs. Old songs? Did she not hear me play Riptide? Okay, one song out of 30 written after 1980 did not count. I had to give my musician's ego a firm down girl. I was strumming a rhythmic song one day and looked up to see a thin woman, half her jaw missing, but still smiling and bouncing up and down. I love that song, she exclaimed after I was done, telling me how much she loved that band. Do you know anything else by them? I didn't, but she was happy to boogie along to the next song I did. I only saw her that one time. The volunteers, mostly older women, were sweet. They sat near clients, talking or simply sitting in silence. One gave hand massages. One, in her 80s, was usually dressed in pastels, her white hair carefully coiffed. She clapped to my faster songs, usually offbeat. She sang, even when she didn't know the words. The clients were fairly mobile, some using a wheelchair or a walker, and only there for the day. We got them out of their house, gave their caretakers a break, and offered social time and something to do. One day, one of the volunteers leaned down close to me between songs and quietly said, a client passed in one of the back rooms. He'll be wheeled down the hallway, and when that happens, there's a moment of silence. A few minutes later, she said softly, it's time. I'd been singing Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. I stopped, the last chord gently fading away. We all turned toward the hall as a group of people, heads bowed, pushed a covered gurney slowly by. A minute later, the boisterous card game resumed, and I finished Hallelujah, Fighting Tears. That's called Hallelujah, and that's from my book, Drive All Day, and I'll put some links around for you to buy the book if you so desire. Thanks, everybody.